Good morning. The Lord be with you. Let's begin with prayer. God, we offer ourselves to you as your servants through this study, that your will may be done in our lives, a will that is always good and loving and supportive and which leads us in the way that you want us to go. Help us to trust ourselves to you and to listen carefully to your voice. Be our teacher and our guide. Strengthen us this day for your service by what we hear and, and say and think. All praise and glory be to you. Amen. So, uh, Psalms 91 and 92. There's some similarities you probably noticed between Psalm 91 and Psalm 90. For example, both begin with, us, with the idea of dwelling in the presence of God. Now, that might have been for the, in the temple where they came specifically to worship and to be in the presence of God in the temple in Jerusalem, but it might be anywhere. Uh, wherever they are, their God is present and they seek to dwell in the presence of God. Lord, in Psalm 90, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Psalm 91, verse 1, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And I was using the NIV, uh, the, the uh, NRSV says in verse 1 of Psalm 91, You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, and so forth. So uh, the, the translations differ a little here. Uh, one of the things that's happening is that the NRSV has chosen to put the opening verses in the second person singular, you, here, you who live, you individuals, possibly second plural, but uh, addressing a community or an individual who puts his life, her life, in the shelter and presence of God. Uh, because the rest of the psalm, uh, until the very end, addresses the individual or the community rather than speaking in the third person, he and she and so forth. But the Hebrew actually has the third person here. Uh, he or she who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty, whoever does and then the T N I V that I'm using has whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Uh, it's one of the benefits actually of comparing different translations. Let me get a third translation out uh, for Psalm 90, and we'll look at the opening, uh, the opening verse of Psalm 90 in the. Um, New American Standard Version, which is preferred by many people because of its more literal uh, translation. Uh, Psalm 91, sorry, Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. That differs from you who live in the shadow of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. So the, NR, the NASV, the New American Standard, has the third person singular, which the Hebrew behind this psalm does have. Uh, and it also has, in the second verse, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Whereas the... Uh, NRSV, which tries to be more gender inclusive, in order to avoid the he of the New American Standard, 
translates it as you, you who live in the shelter of the Most High. You will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So translations do differ. Uh, sometimes it's informative to look at and compare uh, different translations. So some similarities then between Psalms 90 and 91 and, and some differences then among the translations. Possibly uh, this kind of prayer in Psalm 91 was prayed in a community setting in the temple assuring the people of God of God's protecting care for them. Now we'll see at the end of this psalm what God says about that. But the rest of the psalm is a detailed assurance of God's protection and care. And it's quite interesting to me because it has a set of contrasting descriptions. Contra contrasts between what God is, who God is, and contrasted with the threats that arise in everyday life in the ancient Near East. Uh, in Craig Broyles' commentary on the Psalms, he puts it this way in the opening of Psalm 91. A key to understanding this psalm in its original context is to interpret its imagery the dominant image describing the believer the, is that of taking refuge. In other words, the psalm addresses somebody who is already in a covenant relationship with God, at what we might call an Old Testament believer. And that person is in a covenant relationship with God. They take shelter in the presence of God. They trust God. And that person takes refuge in God. The word refuge is mentioned at least three times uh, in this psalm, and it's a dominant metaphor. It's not an abstract metaphor, uh, Broyle says, but a concrete symbol, refuge is, for trust in God that derives from the temple uh, and from the cherubim's wings which are stretched out over the Ark of the Covenant. God's protection is further spelled out by images of a hiding place, a shadow from the burning sun, a military fortress, all of these in verses 1 and 2, a bird protecting her young in verse 4, military defenses in verse 4, angels watching over us in verses 11 and 12. These images are meant to to describe God in a way that encourages people to trust God as their sheltering place, their refuge, their fortress, the one in whom they can be secure and have peace. But that's contrasted sharply in this psalm with images describing threats. For example, the fowler's snare, the deadly pestilence, the pestilence and the plague in verse 6, battle in verses 4 and 5, the arrow that flies by day, deadly animals, the lion, the cobra, the great lion, and the serpent in verse 13. These images allow uh, the psalmist to describe any situation of threat. So strong contrast in this psalm between images of security and assurance, all associated with God, and images of threat coming from human beings or from nature itself. So the opening of the psalm has the reader saying to God, I trust you, I take refuge in you. You are my fortress and my refuge, my God in whom I trust, because the speaker has taken refuge in the shadow or the shelter of God. Actually, the two terms used here for God, 
most high and almighty are ancient terms, even preceding the rise of Israelite religion. They were used of other gods in the ancient Near East and adopted by the Israelites as further descriptions of their god, uh, God Most High, El Elyon, and God El Shaddai, God Most High, the Almighty, God Almighty. So these descriptions of God begin the psalm with an emphasis on taking shelter in the presence of God. Uh, just as in Psalm 90, we heard, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Then reasons are given as to why this person should take refuge in God. Why? Because God will deliver you from the fowler's snare, from the deadly pestilence. God will cover you with God's wings and in God you will find refuge because God's faithfulness is a protection, a shield and a buckler. This is what God does for the one who takes refuge and shelter in the presence of God. Then it turns to talking about you, the reader, the one who does this sheltering and dwelling in God's presence. You will then, because of who God is, you will then not fear the terror of the night, or the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction at noonday. Notice the parallelism in verses 5 and 6 between day and night, darkness and noonday. Covering all time, whatever time it is, you will not be, need to be afraid because God is the one in whom you have taken refuge. He then interprets, he then uh, discusses the fact that possibly in the image of a battle, people will be falling at your side left and right, a kind of hyperbolic image. 10,000 is often a hyperbole in the Bible, uh, not to be taken literally. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will be miraculously delivered from the threat that other people are experiencing. You will, and you don't have to do anything. That's the surprising thing about verse 4 or verse 8. You don't have to do anything. You just look with your eyes and see the just judgment or punishment on the wicked. So those who are falling at your side, right or left hand, uh, are those on whom the just judgment of God has fallen. A kind of karma, in a way, that repays, in the view of this psalmist, uh, repays the, the wicked and the evil for the harm that they have done to the earth and to other people. And so the psalmist says that even though that's happening to the, to the wicked, to the sinful, uh, it won't happen to you because God will be your refuge and and he will, it will not come near you, this threat will not. So that's the first half of the psalm. The first half begins with taking shelter in God, talks about what God will deliver you from and what God will use to do that, and then your response to that is not fearing um, the threats that have come, even though it, they have been deadly threats that uh, those who are not in a covenant relationship with God, uh, threats that they will not escape, uh, they will fall, but you will be protected. It will not come near you. Then the second half of this psalm starts the same way that the first half started. Did you notice that? Verse 9 reflects verse 1, doesn't it? Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place. And again, not only recalling the first verse of this psalm, but <clears throat> also the first verse of the previous psalm, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. So this, this emphasis on our part, we the readers, is that we are those who take refuge in God no matter what the threats are that are happening to us. We talked about in the Monday study group this morning that 
people in the modern world, especially in the West, uh, in the first world uh, economies, have lots of places to turn to get help when trouble comes. We have authorities that can help us. We have friends who can help us. We have uh, medical people who can help us and police forces who can help us. We have places to turn, which are hopefully dependable. Not everybody experiences the same dependability from those who are supposed to serve and protect, but we have these places to turn. In the ancient world, you just had your family and God. Uh, there weren't a lot of medical facilities. There weren't people who were diagnosing diseases and producing uh, drugs that would help people overcome their diseases and live longer and, and uh, ameliorate their suffering. Uh, we have those blessings, and they're all gifts from God. All the medical personnel and all of the helpful drugs that we take uh, are gifts from God to enable us to live well, to live better, uh, to be healed of suffering, all of which we give thanks to God for. But in the ancient world, you only have God to take refuge in. Yes, your family will help you, and that's provided by God too. But there's a sense in these Psalms that the only place to turn is to take refuge in God when the threats arise. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place, then you can be assured that no evil will befall you. No scourge come near your tent. Uh, we pray in the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil. Lead us not into hard testing, but deliver us from evil. And we pray that, and the psalmist prays that, and he knows that if he makes God his dwelling place, then he will be protected from harm and evil. That's his expression of assurance and hope in God that this will be true because there's nowhere else to turn. You turn to God alone. Now, these promises seem like blank checks, don't they? That you just trust God and nothing bad will ever happen to you. But that's not really what the psalm is saying. And we know, we readers who've been reading the psalms, know that Psalms 88 and 89 are the complete opposite. They are people, Psalm 88, the psalmist has simply almost given up, except he's still praying. He knows that only God can fulfill the promises that Psalm 91 has in it. But he hasn't experienced those. And he's dying friendless and suffering. Uh, and he, he just asks, how long, oh God, is this going to happen? And the same in Psalm 89, where the destruction of Jerusalem has taken place and people have been taken into exile and they have been shamed and there's no, there's no son of David, no descendant of David to rule on the throne. And so Psalms 88 and 89 are psalms of despair and hopelessness and wondering how long our suffering will go on. And, Psalm, and, and yet Psalms 90, 91, and 92 are all psalms of hope that God is the one in whom they take refuge. Keep on praying, keep on trusting, and your deliverance will be at hand. It, the evil will not for long come near you or scourge come near your tent. So in the ancient world, these promises might seem to be somewhat like guarantees, but we also know the realism of the Psalms that bad things do happen to good people and yet good people, these covenant people who are in a covenant relationship with God, who've made the Lord their dwelling place, they know that God will come and deliver them. And how will that happen? Why can you take refuge in God and be assured that no evil will befall you? Well, Psalm 91 and verse 11 says, it's because God will command his angels to guard you in all your ways. This is uh, the one of the origins of the idea that <clears throat> everyone has a guardian angel. And so, and of course, verses 11 and 12 were used by Satan in the temptation of Jesus. 
he, Satan quotes verses 11 and 12 uh, to tell Jesus, just jump off the temple and the angels will take you and, and protect you and lift you up lest you cast your foot against the stone. Uh, we talked a little bit about that. I think one way of understanding what the devil is doing in verses with verses 11 and 12, quoting the Bible to Jesus, is that the devil is hoping that Jesus is a fundamentalist and he will take verses 11 and 12 literally and will just sim simply jump off the temple and test God to see whether God will literally fulfill, as a fundamentalist might, uh, verses 11 and 12. But instead, of course, Jesus knows that something deeper is at stake and that he is not to put God to the test and tempt God, that you are to worship God alone and not to put God to the test by uh, taking literally something that may not have been intended to be taken literally. Uh, this, this is very tricky on Satan's part to use the Bible, the word of God, to contradict and threaten the Son of God. Uh, a very interesting passage in Luke chapter 4. So he will command his angels to guard you in all your ways, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on beasts that can be deadly, lions and adders, young lions and serpents. Uh, notice the Hebrew, the Hebrew par poetic parallelism in verse 13. And then finally at the end of this psalm, the, the ch there's a change of who's speaking. The psalmist has been speaking to the reader using you for the most part, except for those opening verses that we saw the different translations have. But in the end here, now God is speaking and God doesn't exactly repeat the blank check promises of the previous verses, at least as I read it. God says, those who love me, that is those who are in a covenant relationship with me, those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. So deliverance and protection promise to those who call on him. When they call on me, I will answer them. Will there be no trouble, no difficulty, no harm, no danger? No, I will be with them in trouble. They will need to be rescued, and I will rescue them and honor them. I will bring them long life and satisfy them with my salvation. So God makes promises similar to the ones earlier in the chapter. But the implication is that believers, those in a covenant relationship with God, who take shelter in the Most High, will still experience life's vicissitudes, the ups and downs of life, the, the suffering as well as the times of joy, and that God will be with them and protect and deliver them through times of difficulty, not by avoiding those times of difficulty. That's how I'm reading the end here when God makes God's promises to his people. Yes, they are promises of protection, and care and rescue, but there's no promise that life will always be easy. Uh, and, and so the psalm ends with God affirming God's faithfulness and steadfast love and care of God's people and affirming that they need to continue to take refuge in him and to make the Lord their dwelling place. Now that's, that will take up most of our discussion today. Psalm 92 is uh, in a little briefer, and it's more, uh, more focused on a psalm of thanksgiving. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to God, to declare God's steadfast love and faithfulness day and night. Notice these two Pair, this pair of terms that occurs over and over again as the key descriptor of who God is, that God is steadfast love and faithfulness. And so people praise God and give thanks to God. This is uh, titled a 
in the uh, subtitle of the psalm, the heading, a psalm, a song for the Sabbath day. So this was a psalm that was sung in the temple and after the temple, in the synagogues and so forth, sung as a part of the liturgy of the worship of the people of God when they gathered together on the Sabbath day. Music was played. The lute and the harp and the melody of the lyre contribute to the praise and thanksgiving due to God. People feel this way because God has made them glad by God's work. Verse 4, at the works of your hands I sing for joy. And this usually refers to God's actions in the history of Israel, in the history of God saving God's people through the Exodus and other times of deliverance. People look back at the deliverance that God has provided, maybe the same kind of deliverance that's described in the previous psalm, uh, in Psalm 91, where God says he will deliver, protect, answer, rescue, honor, and so forth God's people. Now the people in Psalm 92 are praising and thanking God for that deliverance which God has shown to them. People praise God for God's works by saying, How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. So not only what God has done, but the word of God, the teaching of God expressed in God's thoughts as it has come to people through the scriptures, through the Hebrew Bible, through the Old Testament. Uh, they see the thoughts of God and they marvel at the depth of God's wisdom, just as uh, Paul does at the end of Romans 11 in the New Testament. Now, not everybody <clears throat> is like this. There are people who don't gather on the Sabbath day to worship God. Uh, this psalmist calls these people in the NRSV, calls them dullards. Verse uh, 6, the dullard cannot know, the stupid cannot understand this. In the TNIV, it says senseless people do not know, fools do not understand. And in the New American Standard, it also says a senseless man has no knowledge, nor does a stupid man understand this. So it's talking about two different classes or groups of people. People who praise and thanks God and, and, and thank God and who, and who see what God has done. Others who don't see what God has done, who don't understand God's word and God's actions. And instead their lives are are wicked and they are evil doers. They're compared to the grass that sprouts up in the morning but is doomed to destruction by the time the hot sun arises in midday in the afternoon. These are doomed to destruction because they don't dwell and take refuge in the presence of God. They don't worship God, give praise and thanks to God. Instead, they harm other people, they harm the earth, they harm themselves, and, and so ultimately they are doomed to destruction in the view of this psalmist. But in contrast to them, the Lord is on high forever. Notice the stark contrast between the last line of verse 7 and the verse 8. They are doomed to destruction forever, but you, O Lord, are on high forever. And so if you take your refuge in God, you too will be on high forever. You will be with God forever, participating in the life of God because you take refuge in God. God's enemies will perish. And so then, because you take refuge in God, your enemies become God's enemies and they will perish and be scattered for those who take refuge in God. Again, the, the believer, the one in a covenant relationship with God, doesn't have to take any action. God accomplishes the defeat of the enemy. And instead, God exalts his people with strength, verse 10, like the horn of the wild ox, and refreshes and renews his people with fresh olive oil, a symbol of renewal. Uh, 
and we simply see the downfall of our enemies and hear about those who would harm us having come to no good end. Instead of being like grass that flourishes in the morning but is dried up and passes away in the afternoon, instead of being like grass, like the wicked, the righteous flourish like a palm tree and like a cedar, symbols of fruitfulness and symbols of strength like the palm tree that is planted by streams of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither. Whatsoever it does prospers. From Psalm 1, the very first psalm that we began our study with, the righteous flourish like a palm tree and grow with strength like the cedars of Lebanon. They are planted in the presence of God in the house of God where they've taken shelter and refuge, as we saw in the previous psalm. They flourish, but where do they flourish? They flourish where God is, in the courts of God. Even in old age, they still produce fruit. That is, their lives continue to produce what we might call the fruit of the Spirit, mentioned in Paul's letter to the Galatians in chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, among other fruits that are the product of God's work in our lives when we establish ourselves and grow and are planted and rooted and grounded in the presence of God and the love of God. They, even in old age, they produce fruit, and that fruit shows that it's all about God. It's all about God who is upright, God their rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Well, two psalms, uh, one uh, detailing the protective care of God against the threats which were common to everyday life, and a second psalm praising God and thanking God for God's works in, in watching over God's people, in establishing and planting them and making them fruitful so they can give glory to God at the same time defeating the enemies and those who would be a threat to the well-being of the people of God by the people's own trust in God. All right, Psalms 91 and 92. Uh, an overview, a brief overview of the content of those two psalms. We will move on next week to a very brief psalm, Psalm 93. I think it's only five verses. And then a longer psalm, 21 verses in Psalm 94. Uh, we are well on our way to being two-thirds of the way done with our study of the book of Psalms. And they get richer, don't they, as we go along. God bless you. Have a wonderful week in God's presence as you shelter and take refuge in him.